From the great halls of their house, there are assembled three who hope to one day be the world's greatest driving heroes. Created from the cosmic legends of the universe comes our team captain, the Vision, Bill Fisher. And their soon-to-be Wonder Woman, Vicky Fisher. And our Captain Marvel and head flight trainee, Jennifer Scripchuk. Their mission, to fight injustice, share what is right and wrong, to get you out of your house and come out racing with them and serve all mankind. They are the Garage Heroes in Training Team. Welcome to the Garage Heroes in Training Podcast. I'm going to be one of the hosts for this episode. My name is Bill. Who else is hosting? I'm Vicky. You are Miss Vicky. Yes. Guest. Returning guest. Yes. Returning, yes. returning, returning, returning guest. <laughs> he is a man who is never bored. He's been a professional race driver. He has won the Daytona 24. He's won the Sebring twice, excuse me, the Sebring 12 twice, which adds the 24. Maybe there's some kind of thing going there. We know him from what was Racers 360, which is now Blaze. And I believe he has 3,000 plus subscribers, which is fantastic. We've done several videos. He's even said occasionally we did something right. You never know. He still tolerates us and new to this, he is an author, published the book called Send It, The Art and Science of Racing Cars. We heard it came out. We ordered it immediately. It came in. We read, I think, 20 pages and said, Dion, we need to talk. And uh, he still tolerates us. He said yes. So welcome back to the podcast, Dion. Thank you so much. So how many episodes in until I've been considered a co-host? Uh, ah. Well, you know, with co-hosting duties becomes uh, you have producer duties. So if you know somebody, and, and who's, duties. If, if you know somebody who should come on, they are obviously welcome because that's one less person I have to contact. So yeah, so you know, it. Uh, you already have the uh, the co-hosting payment from us, so you know that's exactly we're at equal level there. And, I, I've, uh, I've got. I'm going to go splurge and get a cappuccino rather than normal black coffee tomorrow. Really, okay. you know, with the, with the hosting <laughs> pay and the four dollars you add, you can buy a four dollar cup of coffee. There. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Perfect for the coffee here in Austin. Well, wow. thank you guys for having me on. I really appreciate it, and looking forward to a fun a fun evening as we always have. We we try, and uh, hopefully you can get more than a cup of coffee from your book because it's worth it. <laughs> Appreciate it. Appreciate it. You know, I, I I will say this: once I am done with my grubby little hands, I haven't decided if Vicky's going to read this book or we're going to get her a second book because she needs to read this because there's some stuff in there that I think is uh, mm -hmm. written in a way that she will get there, and she's got a big big year settled for 2024, so she's got some Ooh. some goals. What what are your goals going into 2024? Uh, for me, um, I am going to finish out my training. I'm at uh, level three now, going to level up to four and either get training or my comp license or instructor. Very comp license. cool. I yes, love it. It, requi it requires me <laughs> to travel and uh, Bill is going to hub out of the house and let me and my sister go. Oh, with the that's cars. awesome. Oh, yeah, that's going to be such so a cool excited. year ahead. Where, where, what track do you think you'll go to for the comp license? Uh, we're going to go out to NASA Great Lakes and yep. work out that way. So shout and out then, to them. Love them. I yep. do love them. I really, really yep. do. They are so good. So mm -hmm. um, I do know that Mid-Ohio is being repaved. Yep. So uh, that's probably going to be one of the first tracks I'm going to hit. That's the most local track to us for Mid-Ohio. I mean, not Mid-Ohio, awesome. but for Great Lakes. Yeah. The race is a little closer, but it's only once. Mid Ohio, I think, is three times this year. So, yep, nice. Yeah, I that track needed to get repaid. They need a little bit more revamping in the paddock as well. But I'm super excited. Like the, we all know the sealer, right? Now mm -hmm. it's, it's be really interesting to see how this track, the dynamic changes. So I'm sure it'll be a, a lot different now. Yeah, see, I, I've got to bet that now that it's repaved and the sealer's gone, it's never going to rain there again. You know. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> they, it's the, the new cure to, to like like too much rain, monsoon season. Let's just go repave a racetrack. Yeah, we'll be, just repave it, and you don't have to worry about it anymore. <laughs> exactly. So. Although it'll it'll of course rain while you repave it. That that's the thing. And then once Obviously. you're finally done, then, then yeah. it'll stop. 
Yeah, they're they're repaving that and they're repaving the local track for us as NJMP. So they're repaving Thunderbolt. So Oh, I didn't know that. Awesome. Yeah, they were they're doing it in two pieces now. They're repaving what they had and then they were going to repave some new um routes around there. So mm-hmm. like you could skip the octopus and things like that, but I think that got delayed to a I'd be two. a fan of that. I, I think the octopus is like one of the stupidest things, especially when it's like 105 degrees out there and there's no grip in the world. But you know that's that's just my opinion. <laughs> well I mean you know, one thing that does make the octopus a little bit more fun is when it's 105 degrees and there's 150 cars there. So that's really a lot of that fun. is true. I have not experienced that. That does sound like a lot more fun. <laughs> it, it 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 gets entertaining really fast. <laughs> I still that track one of my the the memory every time someone says njmp it was i think the first or second year we went there with grand am the track had just opened mm-hmm. and that was in the daytona prototype era, era and that's when scott pruitt lost the car going on the front straightaway and oh, hit the fun. guardrail yeah. and the car split in half the front half of the car landed up in our pit box and we're all just like looking at it like what he just hopped out like nothing like nothing had happened it was one of the more incredible things i've seen yeah <laughs> that's not a good turn to lose it there's no, no, that pit wall was placed in the exact wrong spot. <laughs> uh huh. It is. It is. It, yeah, but that's well, racing. What can you do? Yeah. Well, you could read a book and learn how not to do that. <laughs> <laughs> that that's a lot of work. Well, all right. So what I do is I read your book that you wrote for me, and that is what I thought we'd talk about a little bit today. Let's do it. Let's do it. So, so the thing that comes to mind is you've got a. Um, you know, you've, your your full time part time job is uh, coaching now, and that could be in person or at the track. Why did you see the need to write a book? I mean, there's lots of books. I maybe I've got too much hand, time on my hands, and I didn't know yeah. what to do with it. Did, did you <laughs> listen to the intro? Off season. <laughs> your intro says <laughs> otherwise, sir. I mean. You know. <laughs> I don't, to be honest, I have no clue. Uh, I remember I was, we, I was out walking the dogs with, with my wife and I was just like, you know, I feel like this was, this was December last year. Um, so almost 12 months ago, I was like, you know, I feel like I should write a book. And she was like, yeah, go for it. And I was like, sure. Okay, let's do it. And to be honest with you, I just find people consume information in many different ways. Um, mm-hmm. I try to put all of my knowledge out there. I find in our sport, for whatever reason, there's a lot of secrecy. Like everyone thinks they have the secret sauce, which is just total and utter bullshit. Um, mm-hmm. Because there is no secret. We're all doing pretty much the same things. As some people can do it a little bit better than others. Um, and I thought, like, let me just, I've got this information. That I'm already writing every week for our Blades members in the newsletter we send out. Um, I have this sort of process that I think is pretty unique in terms of how you build up and go over the limit systematically in a way that sort of makes sense. I got time in my hand. So if no one else is going to do it, I should do it. Um, And I think it's just was, I wanted something that I would want to read and I'm a very different type of person than a lot of race car drivers. I'm not an engineer. Uh, I struggle with a lot of material out there being a lot more dry, a lot more in depth, a lot more, I don't know, just a little bit over the top. And I like to try to simplify things. And I just wanted to write something that was more for the me when I was starting, that more my type of read, kind of to the point, more visual, stuff like that. So, you, so you're not going to show off just how smart you are and what a great vocabulary you are by writing your book and, and making it seem harder than it really is? You know, I, I would that would require me to have maybe my wife sitting next to me feeding me <laughs> answers on how to say this because I just couldn't pull that one off. <laughs> Amazon has some toilet paper you can use. It's got like word of the day thing. You might might need to go that. <laughs> there way. we go. Yeah, absolutely. Let me go find the biggest word I can and use it wrong. Exactly. There you got to go. use it. Uh. Use it that day. So that's the goal. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. You're on to me here. <laughs> Secrets out. <laughs> So yeah, I'd love to hear you. You had mentioned that you you think there's a couple things in there that might help Vicky in terms of like unlocking that next step. I would love to hear what you thought those those pieces of of information were for Vicky. All right, so Dion is going to make me sleep in the bathtub again. That's fine. Um, <laughs> so, That's why you bring me on. <laughs> I know. It's like, oh boy, uh, she's 
you know, it, before I answer that, she, we went to a, the last event and she's like, you know, I'm like, what are your goals for the event? And she's like, I really want to get somebody in the, in the car to write seat with me. You know, I'd, I'd even take you. And I was like, oh, <laughs> thanks. thanks. Wow. Ouch. That's progress. <laughs> that's progress. <laughs> I know. Amazing. I'm, I'm I know. sure th- I didn't mean it to come out as harshly as it did, but. You know, That's just okay. like I, I really need P- I really need somebody in the seat with me because there's obviously some some habits that I've held back, all, you know, that I've developed. Yeah. I know that I've probably developed and I'm not going to get past those on my own, obviously. So totally. I'm just like I need to get somebody in. But um, so when writing this book, um, who was the basic audience that you were aimed at? What type of car and what level of driver? It's a great question. You know, for me, it was uh, less, it's not aimed at like the total beginner. It was more, you know, the, the drivers that we coach at Blaze every day. It's somebody that is anywhere from they've done their first two, three track days up to somebody that's, you know, been competing, let's say, in the runoffs for the last 15 years and is just a little bit frustrated with where they are. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I, I think the, the information provided here requires you to have some context of just like basic. I, I've driven on a racetrack before, but that's about it. Like you don't need to know much more than that. Um, but I think it'll also be for the experienced person. It, it create. I find a lot of times adding, adding structure and wording around our process and what we do can be helpful. Um, and that's sort of one of the things that I learned when I retired is, you know, when I was you know still racing, and I'd still say I'm, I'm still somewhat quick behind the wheel. I'm not completely lost it. But when I retired, you know, I didn't, I was quick, but I didn't necessarily, a lot of it was just, I did it. I don't know necessarily what I was doing or what the process was. And just from me learning from the other coaches that we've worked with at Blaze, learning from Ricky Taylor and Ken Hill and Colin Mullen and how they've, explain things it's sort of just formalized and crystallized like wait okay so that weekend i did this thing and that's why i was slower that weekend or quicker that weekend so even for me you know a lot of what i've written in the book i didn't know when i was racing professionally sure i did a lot of it but i didn't have a process built around it so even for someone like me reading this would have just like structured things in a better way on how i would approach race weekends or coming up to speed so um, it's, it's definitely, I don't want to say it's for everyone, right? I would say it's, you know, if you've done two or three track days and you're just interested in like, what do I need to do? Like, what is, what does excellence in this sport look like? What does improvement in the sport look like? And even if you've been doing it for 20 years, I don't think it's been explained in a way that I've sort of started to, and it, it, it's not from me, it's me learning from many others and just sort of crystallizing it into one thing, but kind of giving structure around how do we how do you drive a race car fast and why is it fast like why is what why is that process work so in an effort to to answer your question i'm going to go back because vicky gave me a little 30 seconds to uh figure it out so i think for for vicky especially i think the the key would be um how you broke things down into fundamentals and Mm -hmm. what those fundamentals are and then specifically mm-hmm. for her would be the the throttle and braking application. And I think the biggest weakness that she has is she, I know I'm wording this very carefully, um, is she doesn't really have a plan firmly in her head for mm-hmm. what to do and where to do things. And it's kind of like more feel than planning or structure. <laughs> So to, to, to build on that, pretty accurate. Yeah, to build on that, so I think I saw recently through Blaze, I've coached about thirteen hundred drivers now or in, in that ballpark. I've actually come across not a single driver that I would say has the uh, a a plan that I would be like, yeah, that's a great plan. Uh, it is the biggest area lacking in 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 all of grassroots racing today, and even some across pro uh, pro racing as well. But so you're, I, all I'm just saying is you're not alone there. Uh, and I know it sounds like homework, but it 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 can take twenty seconds. Uh, and it, once you get experience, it just becomes instinctual. But that is, I, I think you hit the nail on the head there, Bill. Like 
having a plan when you hit the track, just, oh my gosh, it just makes everything else easier. And then you adjust, you know, because, you yeah. know, it's like the uh, the Tyson thing. Everybody's got a plan until they get it in the face. Well, everybody's got a plan until they realize that, you know, turn seven's coated in oil, you know. <laughs> everybody's got yeah, a plan until they don't, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and it's, it's as fundamental as, um, you know, like I'm going to call turn three at VIR. It's one of the corners I see the most mistakes at. And one of the most mistakes is people sort of drive into the corner and they're like, how late can I break? And they're like, oh, I'm going to go super late and hard, oh, like threshold breaking. That corner is like, if you go watch a pro, they're like, I'm going to break earlier. I'm going to break lighter because I have a plan of I know how to match my brake pressure to the corner type to have the right car balance. But I've known that before I even hit the racetrack. And it's just like the plan is understanding you know, the corner. What is my priority in this corner? Why is it my priority in this corner? And a lot of that, once you've explained it once, you can get that in like 15 seconds since looking at a track map. Mm-hmm. Hmm. So um, how was the process of writing and how was it for you? Honestly, it really, uh, I found it, I was in a very fortunate position. Um, so through Blaze, one of the things that we do is every Monday we write uh, a newsletter. And that newsletter, I try to cover uh, a coaching point of the week. I include one of it, like an article of the week and a video that I like from whatever of, of the week as well. All, obviously all racing related. So I write a lot anyway. Uh, and as I probably have written, I don't know, 150 of these things, 100 of these things, something like that, I'd always gotten really good feedback. You know, people always seem to really like them. Um, now, again, I don't know if that's just people being nice to me or whatever it might be, but I've always had positive feedback. And it was just sort of one of those things where I was like, I've kind of already written a lot of this. If I just kind of put some structure around it, um, I've, I've got it all up here. Let me just spend time writing. And I, by no means am I the best writer in the world. Uh, I think the very last people in the world that ever think I would be quote unquote an author would be my parents um, mm-hmm. or me. So I'm, you know, it was just one of those things I'd written a ton. I, I had a structure in mind of how I'd like to do it. And it was just, you know, finding time on nights and weekends. And I'd just say, okay, Liz, here's a chapter. I've already written about this thing five different times and done 75 coaching sessions on this topic. Let me just like write it all out and brain dump it. And luckily I have a, a great, editor that she could just go through and clean it up for me and then I can move on to the next topic so I'd probably written this 70-80% of it within three or four months but then what they don't tell you is it's all the rest of the stuff that takes a lot of time the polishing up the editing the formatting for a self-published book and all of that type of stuff is just really where it takes a lot of time it uh it's hard looking at writing a book forward in time but looking back on it it always looks you know that wasn't so bad yeah totally and, and to be honest, i was i was probably opposite on the spectrum where i was like i think i could write this thing in like two months and i was a little over ambitious on that one it, it took me a little bit longer but um it, it's it's a project and but once you also know the tools to use and things like that amazon you know i use amazon self-publishing has made it a lot easier than it used to be that's for sure mm-hmm Indeed. Mm-hmm. Um, so speaking of a process that's going to take a lot longer, uh, for those of us who are audiobook people. Coming out hopefully next week. Get, get out, really? Yeah, I've got my the, the uh, voice actor, I guess they call, mm-hmm. uh, is, is supposed to get me. The, the, actually, he was just emailing me right before I hopped on this. He's supposed to get it to me midweek and i can apply like kind of just check it off make sure it's good and then hopefully next week it'll come out on audible okay so and we can uh we can break a little bit of news for all our listeners their fears are unjustified it's not me (laughs) so very well you don't have to listen to me any more than you already do (laughs) so so if we look at your book from a high level and even if we look at blaze you know we, we've talked about this, I think, every single time you've come on, is that when I played a sport, and that could be, you know, I was good at three, and I played, like, all of them, except hockey. Um, what I did was I tried to figure out what the fundamentals were, and then I practiced my fundamentals until I was good to pretty good, and 
that was tried and true. And then there was, you know, the the little 2% exceptions. We dealt with those. But, you know, the, the, the people who were better were better at the fundamentals. And when you look at racing, it's not really covered that way. It's like there's this magic that the pros do and it's, you know, and then there's the uh, I might as well set you up for your your HPD issue of the 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 HPD line, and mm-hmm. it's a different approach, and it's hard to break a bad habit. That is, it's way harder to break a bad habit than form a good habit early on, right? Um, yeah, you know, it's interesting. I don't know what the dynamic in our sport is, but there's this belief. That it's, I don't know, got like so many like tips and tricks and these like kind of like crazy little things that people do. Like there's just two instances that come to mind here that are the best examples I can give of like the mindset. I was coaching um, a pretty quick DE driver that had been doing this for about 15 years. Um, and we had worked together for a year and we did, I don't know, probably 15 coaching sessions. Every time we went to the race weekend, he sent me this video and we improved it. Made a lot of progress. I think he was going five seconds a lot faster by the end of the year. And at the end of the year, he said, great. I want to, I'm going to renew for next year. I want to work with you again for next year. We, we, we got all the fundamentals this year. So I, I want to move on to the advanced stuff. So like, what are the advanced things that we're going to move on to next year? And I was like, well, like, what are you, what are you thinking here? And he was like, well, I, I don't know. Like, are we going to go over to, you know, math channels or, you know, like a new trail breaking technique. And I was like, no, like we just, you got, 40% better at your fundamentals. Let's go get another 40% better at the fundamentals next year. Like that's just sort of what we do. Right. Mm-hmm. And another customer messaged me um, and he was watching a course and, and um, doing this training. Uh, and, and they were talking about the, the importance of learning left foot braking. And mind you, this guy is like a year one driver really quick for year one driver, but they're talking about the learning, the left the importance of left foot braking because you can learn to sort of accelerate and brake in certain corners so that you can like kind of cover the brake to your left foot and like kind of keep the car planted. And I was like, dude, throughout my 20 year career, I can name one time I did that. And was it way faster? Eh, maybe it was a little bit faster. Why are we learning this? Because it's not going to be important. It's not going to help you. Let's go focus on everything else first. And, you know, it's like people want to teach this like crazy stuff and pretend like pros actually use this. And it's like, no, we don't. We just do the what's the easiest thing. I ain't got time to like figure this whole thing out. Sure, I can do it. But like, that's not that's not where the next second is. Right. So anyway, long story short, we, we definitely have a weird adage in our sport that overlooks fundamentals and believe that it's like some mystic secret way to go fast which just isn't true yeah i i think i think the 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 point in your book where i i added you to our favorite book list was when you started talking about your your first time being on track at a racing school (laughs) it didn't end too well (laughs) it it did not end too well And, and i was listening to another podcast today and they were talking about you know i went through a racing school at I don't think I should say where, but we both know where. And yeah. you go through a five-day course or a seven-day course or whatever it is. And at the end, you get a racing license. And throughout the entire, um, everything from beginning to end, you never race anybody. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. And, and It's wild. And at the end, you're, you're a race car driver. And, you know, you go to your first race. And it's the first time you've ever been on track, potentially, with... A racing situation and you have racecraft and other cars that are actually trying and not like you know simulated ai cars on gran turismo or, <laughs> or something like that and it's just anyway your your first your first time story was uh was tremendously funny and uh well not funny then but funny now uh, yeah it definitely wasn't funny then my my, my uh my parents were were when i i, I for, for a long story short essentially i backed the car into the into Back the car into the wall on the outside of turn 17 at Sebring, like in my first session on track, trying to be a superhero. Um, <laughs> my parents were not too were. impressed on that one. <laughs> I mean, in my mind, I totally was. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're you're right, the natural wasn't. race driver, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Way too much confidence, no skill. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, we, yeah, we we met with somebody and we were talking about it because you know we love racing and sometimes it comes yep. up in most conversations. And uh, we were talking to somebody and they're like, oh, you know, I drive like 40,000 miles a year for work. You know, I don't need to go to HPDs. I just want to start racing. And I'm like, eh, it's really not the same. Yeah. I always say, yeah, sure. Like I, I probably walk 10,000 steps a day. I'm probably ready to go to the Olympics and see if I can beat Usain Bolt. Like, yeah. you know, it's sort of the same thing. Yeah, we're we're, yeah, built, we're built the same. Yeah. I had one guy and he was like, well, you know, I drive a UPS truck, so I drive all the time. <laughs> And I'm just oh, like, it's no. not the same. <laughs> When's the last thing, time you got that thing sideways? That's what I want right. to know. That's the first thing question I would ask. <laughs> wrap that thing around a corner. That's right. <laughs> exactly. So, uh, yeah. so uh, unlearning bad habits versus learning the correct methods from day one. Let's talk about mm -hmm. that. Might yeah, be I mean, ultimately, the... Yeah, the, the best option here is learning the right way from day one. Uh, and it's something that I try to preach all the time. Uh, you know, it's one of the the business challenges that we have at Blaze. Is I think a lot of people look at our team of coaches and say, well, like, you know, I've got to be a race car driver to work with them or I'm not ready to work with them, which is not like we, we tailor, whole point of personalization is let me understand where you are, what you're learning. We tailor it to you, right? Like we've all been track day dr drivers. But anyway, that's sort of a, a side case. So not everybody has the opportunity to learn the right way day one. Um, so well, I would say that's the more boring topic. Mm -hmm. I think it's, let's talk a little bit about how do we, un, how do we undo bad habits? Yes. This is going to be the answer that nobody wants to hear, but really you have to be willing. You have to be consciously willing to take one, two, 20 steps backwards to take a hundred steps forward. You have to throw out that lap timer because you're not going to go faster initially. You're going to struggle initially. You're not going to be consistent initially. You're going to be like, my coach is an absolute idiot. He doesn't know what the hell he's talking about. This feels all wrong. But you have to believe in the process, right? So it, it depends a little bit on the bad habit here. Most drivers, their bad habit is overslowing corner entry and applying throttle too early. Like that is like the number one bad habit in this sport. And the way that I sort of try to fix this is – First, let me tell you why you're getting to throttle too early, right? You're getting to throttle. Well, actually, let me take a step back even further. Let's talk about where we should get to throttle so that you realize that we're on throttle too early. So that's step one. Step two is, okay, now how do we make the change? You've got to, you can't change four things at once. I can't expect you to start braking later, release off the brakes, trail break down to the apex and fire out of there from day one. No, 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 it's not like... I don't care about the brake zone. I don't care about your lap times. I want you to brake where you're braking right now. I want you to brake how you're braking right now. And then I want you to turn into the corner where you usually get the throttle. I need you to say, no, I am not allowed to. I'm going to get off the brakes. I'm going to be off the throttle. I'm going to coast into the corner. I'm saying that's where my throttle spot is. And you've got to be willing to do that, which is going to cause you to go slower, right? Like I'm going to say you're going to spend less time on throttle, but it's going to say it's going to allow you to go 100 steps forward once you've done that but you've got to be willing to go through the process and saying i'm going to take that step back my lap times are going to get worse but that light bulb's going to click you're going to you're going to put yourself in a better position you've got to trust me to be able to do that a lot of drivers just necessarily aren't willing um it's really easy in our sport to blame the equipment right um and that's kind of just calling you know a spade a spade here so it's it's sort of one of the things in our sport where you kind of have to sit down and say, am I willing to do this? Like it, it it's going to take some work to fix bad habits. It's, it, it's going to be worth it, but not everybody's willing to do it. And I think it's just having that conversation with yourself. Wow. So, so what would examples be that come to mind where perhaps through instruction or friends, we're, explain something poorly and then we set ourselves up for limiting ourselves later great question i mean actually uh, this one's come up a lot recently um it's come up a lot recently two different ways so the idea of settling the rear on throttle and i see this used incorrectly in two ways so number one is let's say i'm i'm on throttle I start to feel the rear rotate on me, right? I start to feel it come a more rotation than I want. And I'm like, I'm, I'm in trouble here, right? The car's starting, I'm starting to lose the car. There's this adage of, well, I'm starting to lose the rear, so I need to stay on throttle or add throttle. 
which is the worst thing you can do in that moment because the rear is already over the limit. The rear tires are already sliding on the racetrack. So by adding throttle, you're making that inside rear tire spin even faster, which is going to spin you out. Or you're already over the limit because you probably have too much speed you're just making that worse. So what do I do in that moment when I'm like, oh, I need to wave, wave the white flag. I'm not going to catch this thing or I'm in big trouble. I do the exact opposite. I get off the throttle. Now you're probably thinking to yourself, well, Dion, that makes no sense. You're going to send weight to the front end. This is not going to make things worse. Yes, but that's like way lower on my priority list than just reducing speed and taking load out of the car. So the right answer in that moment is get off the throttle and try to unwind the steering wheel to get the car as straight as possible and then continue to drive. So that's sort of like one. But on that as well is you have this adage of, well, again, I got to sell the rear with, with, with throttle. So that means in a high-speed quarter, I need to be on throttle early. Yes, that's correct. But how early? It's not at the turning point. It's like a car length before the apex. So like the Kinkit Road America, my throttle, I'm starting to crack into it when my right front tire gets out of that apex curve. Turn four at some point, took coach a lot of drivers there. They're like, brake, 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 turn on, and they're on throttle like at the turning point. It's like, no, this is an entry speed corner. Like I'm on throttle like the other side of the apex point. So those are the two things that come immediately to mind that are just caught a little incorrectly. So I was reading that section. And you said the kink, and I was like, yeah. And then I'm and then you went, I think you went to Sonoma or Sebring, I can't remember what it was. Turn 12 at Road Atlanta? Same thing? Most of the cars were flat through turn 12 at Road Atlanta, or you don't have a full lift. So that mm -hmm. one's a little bit different. So if you're if you don't have a full lift through the corner, like you're not all the way off the throttle, it's a little bit different. Most cars are not flat through the kink at Road America, like Indy cars are, but most of the cars that we all drive, it's got a little bit of a brake zone. So I sort of separate, That's this is the nuance of the sport mm -hmm. here, right? Where right. if there's a brake zone, then it's you're still early on throttle, but it's a car length, the car length and a half. It's not the turning point. So the turn 12 is just a little bit of a different one. Yeah, I just remember the first time we ever went there, it was, it was cold and rainy and- uh, That's a different story. We were, we, yeah, we were still relatively new and that's probably the most intimidating entrance I've ever driven through and with a trailer. Oh, yeah. And then, uh, I parked the thing and I was telling somebody how, you know, that was intimidating going in. He's like, well, the one thing you got to do is you got to be on the gas through turn 12. And I'm sitting there looking at it going, I don't know that I want to be on the gas through turn 12, but uh, you know, that's what he said. And, you know, listening to the guys <laughs> in the paddock is never going to get you anywhere well, but you know, no. And, and to be honest with you, I think. I was actually just uh, working with a driver in a GT3 car. We're out at Coda. And if anyone knows Coda, there's turn 19, which is one of the more difficult corners mm -hmm. there. It's just, you never have grip there, right? Uh, and you're always sort of fighting the rear. And so he started to do the throttle at the turning point. And this isn't like a super high-speed corner. I was like, well, what are we doing there? He's like, well, I'm trying to settle the rear. I was like, no, 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 no. Like, just, just come off the brakes and coast. Like, coasting has already got a decent amount of weight on the rear. You don't need to apply throttle. And if you're applying throttle to sell the rear, it's like 1%, 2% throttle. It's not 20% throttle, right? So this is so much nuance to this whole idea that people hear it and then take it, they take, take it to the, like to the extreme to where you're like, what the hell is happening now? Yeah, and I, I think this leads to the thing that I see a lot when I'm instructing and, and, you know, maybe somebody on this podcast does it too, where you're self-inducing understeer. And 100%. artificially limiting yourself because, yeah. you know, and, hey, and the tires happens, were screaming, but, you know, that's not why. Yeah. And then what happens? What do you do? You're like, well, the setup must be terrible. So let me yes. go fix the setup. And that's, now when we go to fix your driving, the car is like all out of whack. And you're like, this doesn't work. And you're like, no, because you've just set up the car around the wrong driving style. <laughs> it happens. It does. <laughs> so um, how about managing speed versus risk and how your book teaches you how and how to not do that? Yeah. So look, ultimately, look, I think it's important to acknowledge that our sport has risks. And I think it's important to acknowledge that everybody has different risk profiles. How I would be coaching, uh, you know, a DE driver that drives seven times a year, that's just out there to have fun and but wants to improve versus someone that's trying to compete for the SEC runoffs is slightly different. I'm going to teach them the same fundamentals, but maybe how much I'm going to push them will be a little bit different because they have different risk profiles, right? And that's kind of one of, one of the reasons why coaching has to be personalized. Now, though, 
the way that I think about finding the limit of the car, because everybody wants to, everyone wants to go faster. Like if you go to any classroom across the United States that's at a racetrack and you're like, hey, do you want to, do you want to go faster? Anybody that doesn't raise their hand is full of, everybody wants to go faster, <laughs> right? Now, I want to teach it in a way that doesn't require you to spin, to crash, or any of that to find the limit because you don't have to. Now, do you have to go a little over the limit to find the limit? Yes, but I've got a systematic way that I myself do, and it's rooted in, number one, I'm going to pick a corner. And I'm going to pick the lowest risk corner on the racetrack to do this in. Now, not every racetrack has a great corner, like seven point, Turn one, yeah, but there's not a gr- like there's not a great corner to experiment with this in. So what I'm doing is I'm gonna pick a slow speed corner, ideally a hairpin, something like that, with a lot of run off road. Now my next step is gonna be okay. I want to find the limit. The safest way for doing that is working backwards. It's much safer to find the limit at the corner exit first than the corner entry first. Why? Because if you break too deep. What is your recourse? Mm. There's nothing you can do. I hope I don't hit something, right? If you start to accelerate too hard, what's your recourse? You back off the throttle a little bit. No harm, no foul, right? So you have a much better recourse at corner exit. So my first step is sort of saying, okay, let me get the corner exit sorted. Let me figure out where I want throttle, my full throttle. Let me figure out my line. Let me get that going. And then it's about systematically adding the entry speed. But it's all then rooted off of a feedback loop. I know where my apex is. I know where my throttle should come. I know where my full throttle should come. And I bring a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. until one of those things breaks. And then you're like, oh, hey, I just went over the limit a little bit. But now I went over the limit and I knew it because I, ran, I, I missed the apex by a couple feet. Or I couldn't apply the throttle where I wanted to because I had a little longer steer. And now we're... Now we're at the limit, but we're our our going over it isn't barreling in at 15 miles an hour too much speed, right? Mm-hmm. It's it's you've built up to it systematically. Um, so for me, I, I you know, a big part of coaching is lowering risk. Is I, I want people to have less incidents. I want you to to spend more time on the racetrack, not fixing things, right? So it's just having a process behind it all. I don't know if that answered your question at all. Yeah. Well, it's yes, the yes. question. The question had two different ways, and one one was I, I always get a kick out of when you explain that you know uh, when you're talking to a race driver, you you don't learn the HPDE line because when you're a race driver, you sit there and say, "What's the fastest, most dangerous way I can get through a turn?" And that's what I want to do because I'm a pro. <laughs> and uh, you know, yeah. If anyone doesn't know the sarcasm in there, <laughs> yeah. if it doesn't look terrifying. It's not real. <laughs> exactly. Like honestly, this is gonna sound like blasphemy, but I feel like the 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 two worst things to happen to, especially grassroots racing, but to be honest with you, per racing as well, there's two quotes. It's the Senate quote, uh, if I see a gap and I don't go for it, I'm no longer a race car driver is like the worst quote. And then the second worst quote, I think it was Mario Andretti that says like, if you're in control, you're not going fast enough. Both of those are the stupidest freaking things. I'm going to yeah. call it out. I love them. I'm, I'm inspired by them. They are way better than I am as race car drivers. But those are stupid quotes that should never be uttered at, at, a, at a racing event. I, I always seem to post my fastest times when I don't feel like I am. Hundred percent, man. Hundred percent, hundred percent. Yeah, isn't that weird? Not surprising. It's so weird. Driving subconsciously, and you're not overdriving the car. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. So, Which is really so, easy to do. Uh, can you walk us through the process of breaking down a track on a map to find the race line? Yeah, I mean, I I think the the process starts with the track map. And obviously you can't tell everything from a track map. Like you showed me, let's use, we're talking about Road Atlanta, right? You just show me the Road Atlanta track map. I would have no clue for the most part that turn 11 is like eight stories down, sharp, mm-hmm. and you don't see elevation game. Now, so track map won't be perfect, but it's a place you start. And, the, and what you start with is sort of looking at the map and you go corner by corner and you look at the exit of the corner. You look at the entry of the corner and you say, okay, do I think this is an exit speed corner or an entry speed corner? And you label each one of those corners, exit or entry speed. Okay. And that what that does is it gives you priority in the corner based on the exit or entry speed. That'll change where your minimum speed in the corner should come. And you kind of identify, okay, 
I, I, I roughly know my priorities in these corners. And just by the shape of the corner, you can kind of tell it's a hairpin or a sweeper. Like you can kind of tell into turn one, sweeper style corner. You can kind of tell into turn seven. Looks more like a hairpin type corner. We're talking road Atlanta here, right? So I can kind of then roughly get an idea of how I think I'll be breaking in these corners. I've got a rough idea of where I'm kind of uh, accelerating. The next step is I'm going to go to YouTube and I'm going to go find the highest quality driver I can find around the racetrack. And I'm going to sort of have my track map, have my beliefs, and I'm going to double check it with YouTube. And I'm going to go, holy crap, that's a big uphill out of turn one. Maybe that changes this corner from an entry speed corner or an exit speed corner. Maybe I adjust some small things. Uh, turn three, there's a big blind brake zone into here. So maybe I'm going to be braking even lighter there than I thought. And I just kind of confirming it all. And I'm looking at what is the, how is there how is how are they breaking to the corner? How are they accelerating? Sometimes they don't have data, so I'm going to listen. I can see the dynamics of the car, and I'm going to understand. Okay, car placement. Why are they placing the car there? Why are they braking with this much pressure? Why are they accelerating here? Asking myself, confirming that, and that's really my process. And maybe finally I'll hop on the sim for a little bit, but even then it's just like getting a rhythm. It's nothing else. Like I'm not trying to be like, well, I break the three board here, so I'll break the three board in real life. No, it's just like getting a feel for. The, how much distance is between corners? And that next one's the right-hander I kind of remember. That's sort of my process. So oh. I, I think the the thing that doesn't make sense, and then it works equally well for golf, if you want to use that as an example, is why you especially break down a turn backwards. But I think you could even do the entire track backwards, and it would work still the same. It's the same thing in golf. You'd work backwards. And... Mm -hmm. It doesn't make sense to some people. So I thought maybe we could talk about that a little bit. It's funny. Like I, I'm a terrible tennis player trying to learn how to play tennis. And a lot of the strokes, you kind of lurk backwards as well, which is really interesting, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, to be honest with you, I, I, it, in, in motorsports, um, so the reason why you want to work backwards is you you have to understand what your goal in the corner is. So, for example, let's let's continue using Road Atlanta. If you had no clue, if you were just following along and you arrive into turn six and you don't look at, like, what comes after turn six, how do you identify what your priority in the corner is and know, oh, like, my priority is entry speed. Like, I really need to maximize entry speed. Or my priority is actually, like, if you don't look at what comes after, how are you supposed to know that, right? Right. So that's sort of step one. So if you... By looking at it backwards, I can go look at a corner out of, out of turn six and say, man, there's barely anything between six and seven. But then out of turn seven, there's a long straightaway. Hmm. Okay. So if there's pretty much no acceleration out of six before seven, and out of seven, there's this long ass straightaway. Well, I know probably exit speed's going to matter here, right? Then we're going to turn six. If I see there's pretty much nothing out after turn six before I get a break for turn seven, but I arrive on a pretty long straightaway into it. Hmm. I think entry speed is going to be pretty important here. And where I want to place the car at corner exit is going to change where I want to apex. And where I want to apex is going to change where I want to turn in. And where I turn in is going to change where I break. So it's all dictated on where you place the car at corner exit and what your priority in the corner should be. Mm -hmm. okay. So... Uh, <clears throat> I guess that gives you the, like in my mind when I'm when I'm comfortable with a track, I know where I am without using my eyes, even though I still fight. Yeah, too. totally. So that's kind of where you know you you know where you want to end up. So you, again, that goes back to the the planning part. And you know, yeah. if, if you're going in blind or unclear, then you can't really commit to it. Yeah, and, and the big thing is just as, as simple as it seems, just kind of goes back to that plan which which you just identified where it's at least knowing what is my priority in this corner and i would i, I would venture to say 85 percent of drivers probably don't know what their plan in the corner is like when i ask people like well, what do you what's your priority in this corner i hear things like well it's a trail breaking corner like, what no no that, that's not a thing um it's an exit speed corner an entry speed corner or a balance speed corner your priority needs to be one of those three things how do you do this how do you know what those are um, mm -hmm. for, for pros, that's instinctual and it just needs, and it's, it's not a complicated thing. It's just taking a few moments to learn. And then all of a sudden that light bulb goes out and you think about corners in a very different way. Mm -hmm. hmm. I like that. 
Uh, how about for new drivers? One of the difficulties we see is a lot of managing information overload. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. This is uh, so. Uh, what are the fundamentals you can help with that? Yeah. Look, at the end of the day, let's say someone's brand new to the sport, first day on the racetrack. No matter what, you're going to be drinking through a fire hose. Like there's, 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 you, you can't simplify things down too much. Now, I can probably simplify like things down from feeling like you're drinking from a dam to drinking from a fire hose, right? Uh, and I think it's, it comes back to knowing what the fundamentals are, right? So in, in tennis, my, you know, coach, if, if he was going to work with a day one person, he's probably not talking a lot about, covering the ball for top spin and he's probably not talking about hitting a kick serve whatever it might be all he's saying is hit on the contact point of the ball should be just in front of that right hip and what do they do they take you up to the net and they have you stand and they have you almost like whack the net with your racket and they have it whack it where the where you're supposed to hit the ball and it's all about i don't care what happens to the ball i don't care about going in i don't care about like your back swing or your forward, forward swing or follow through any of that. All I care about is you just hitting the ball in that spot. Don't care about anything else. And it, and 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 how I would go about teaching a beginner is sort of the first and foremost for me is car placement. I want you to. Mm -hmm. I don't care about lap times. I don't. Care, I don't want you going fast. I don't want you trail breaking. I'm not even telling you what the term trail breaking is. I want you just to place the car in the right place. Mm -hmm. A second bonus, and depending on the driver, some drivers will adapt a little bit quicker. Um, some drivers don't. The second bonus would be, and I want you to start applying the throttle in the right place. Only two things I care about. I'm going to force you to brake really damn early. You're going to probably feel really slow in the corners. Not everybody. Some people already feel fast and they're like 30 miles an hour on the limit. Great. I only care about those two things. Let's place the car in the right place. And let's start to try to apply the throttle in the right place. Even that second one's a bit of a stretch for most drivers. And that's really it. And then what we do is we just systematically build from there. Little by little by little. What about if you have somebody who's, you know, basically first day and they're actually pretty good? Like their placement's not bad. They're <laughs> car carrying a decent amount of speed, probably more speed than they're probably ready for. Like mm -hmm. I had a driver that I, they were quite good first day. No problem. Did a lot of eye racing, did a lot of sim racing. Yep. But I didn't want to put him in HBDE2 because I thought they needed to make more mistakes and know how to get out of them before they went to go I fast. Like that. So any ideas on how to? So to be honest with you, I've never heard of the framing in that way. Like I, I want you to make more mistakes uh, at this level, which I first off, I applaud you for that. I think a lot of instructors, coaches try to uh, like – avoid that term, um, try to teach people to be perfect. I like good mistakes. I think good mistakes are good things to do. So just kind of caveat kudos, like let me kind of applaud that. I really like that framing. I'm going to steal it from you. Um, so I would say this is where it's personalized, right? If I see somebody that has a good understanding of the fundamentals, um, that is applying them in the right way, that is pretty confident in the car, I would be wanting to see can they consistently do it? Which is a little bit hand in hand with what you're saying. Um, mm -hmm. I think we're both saying, I don't think you can consistently do it. I think you're going to make more mistakes, right? Yeah. Which is not a bad thing. It's just the reality. Right. Um, so all I would want to say is, okay, great. Um, now I want you, you've got a fundamentals. You're applying the throttle in the right place. You're getting the full throttle in the right place. I want you to go and you're placing the car in the right place. I want you to go drive the entire session. And I want you to not have a single lap where once everything's up to temp and, and stuff like that, Right. Or you're deviating from that. And that's sort of how I would approach it. And to be honest with you, I mean, if they're executing, they're executing, right? Then then I'd be fine to, you know, I, I won't jump steps. But if they're already doing steps one, two, mm -hmm. and three, I'm going to still explain, hey, this is what you're doing. This is why you're doing it well. But I'm okay with accelerating the timeline. Like, I've got no problem with that. Yeah, the, the difference between the one and the two for the organization we were with is, one, you get uh, an instructor with you every single session. And in yeah. two, you might get one per weekend. Yeah, I probably wouldn't be making that big of a jump that yeah. early on. That was I why I, was, yeah, I, yeah, totally. I wanted to hold him a little bit. He yeah. was fine with it. So, yeah. you know. Yeah, totally. And to be honest with you, I think, like, I remember my first 
time going from open wheel skip barber to closed cockpit i want to say i went to like a chin event or something like that and it was like some bmw and there was a guy that was pretty quick i don't remember his name or anything i feel terrible um but we was like he sat with me right and you know i was a tin top and i had a the mirror in front of me and i was driving his h car. i don't know what the hell i was doing so he kind of took me around then the whole first day i was still pretty quick knew what i was doing but he sat next to me and i was very appreciative of him sitting next to me around sebring wailing around this thing um so yeah i even someone like at my level from karting and spent a long time doing that having at least a full couple days with someone next to you is super helpful yeah totally so what are the fundamentals, um, say, for instance, car positioning, throttle, application, just he the wrote, basics? He wrote them in the book. Yes, he did. <laughs> I did. I did, actually. Did all the I, fundamentals. I haven't, no, I haven't actually, let go of the book long enough for her to you read gotta it You got to go yet, buy so. it to, to read go it to then the listen book. to this podcast. To, to listen to this podcast to be able to get to the fundamentals, right? That's, That's right. right. So the fundamentals are, you know, high level starts with car positioning, right? Everything is that. After that, I want everyone to think about what are the inputs that I make as a driver, right? The inputs are your throttle, your braking, turn and point. Any input I make into the car is going to turn into one of the fundamentals, which is really those three things. And then I'll add on a couple things like vision and uh, vision and focus, right? Body positioning as well as a fundamental. But those are a little bit ancillary. So. What it really boils down to a lot of our fundamentals, uh, and I stole this from Ken Hill, which I, and I really like this framing, is your first 5% and your last 5% of your inputs. Your inputs meaning your brake application, your throttle application, your turning kind of input and output. And if the fundamentals are really, what do I do in the first 5% of those and the last 5% of those? Um, and I, I thought that was a really good way to, to word it. Like if you're, like for example, that includes your initial throttle application point, your very initial throttle application point, which is one of the most fundamental things that we do. And all of those inputs affect the weight transfer of the car and everything that we're doing as a race car driver is adjusting weight transfer to do what I needed to do, right? Uh, so if you just think about any input I make, that first 5% of it, and then the last 5% of it, so that means my initial throttle application and then the last like going from 95 to 100% throttle or my initial break point and the end of my brake zone. All of those are sort of the fundamentals at a very high level. So when you say car positioning, so we're, we're going to a, a left-hand turn. Let's say it's turn seven at uh, NJMP Lightning. You know, just, mm -hmm. not, yeah, that yeah. That, not that that pokes at anybody, but when you say <laughs> car positioning, so you're going to have a, a left turn coming. It's 90 plus or minus turn, 90 degree turn. When you say car positioning, you want to be all the way to the right, not like kind of to the right, not like mostly to the right, not like th half a car length to the right off. You want to be on the white mm -hmm. line if, unless it's wet. Yeah. Yeah. I think it, it's, uh, yes, I would say there's a lot more to it than that. Um, so once again, I would start backwards and like, okay, where do I want the car placed at corner exit? Now I would say, there is, I would teach 80% of this to a beginner. And then as they get a little bit more comfortable, a little bit more advanced, I'd kind of coach the last 20%. So I'm not coaching them incorrectly. I'm just going to get more focused on the finite details here. Um, so a beginner, I'm like, hey, I just want you to get out to the exit curve. Hey, corner exit. I'm going to make this up, right? An advanced mm -hmm. person is, I want you to get out to the exit curve by that second red stripe on the curve. Right. Mm -hmm. That's the level of detail. So nothing changed, just the intensity of the details changed. Right. So first step for car placement is where do I want the car placed at corner exit? Second step is where do I want my apex? What is the car angle I want at my apex? And by the way, because I figured out the exit point, I kind of figure out my apex point and car angle to get to that exit point. Right. Mm -hmm. And then I come to the turn in point and where do I want the car placed to turn in to do that? Now I just do those three things. Right. Um, and that's really it from car placement because the rest of the time you'll be able to kind of draw the line and connect the dots. Indeed. So I guess, you know, we're going to, we're going to upset some of the, because it's Cyber Monday. So, you know, just to put a date on here, we're going to upset some of the uh, potential businesses that are going to be affected by the answer to this question. But one of the things that we've been saying a lot, and, and since you said it in your book, 
we must be right for once who knew um <laughs> is that the collective we should stop changing setups in their car or changing upgrading their car until their fundamentals are solid yeah I, I, until I, I again i'm not against making cars go faster i freaking no. love when cars go faster give me horsepower give me arrow give me all the upgrades in the world so let me just be really clear i'm not against that but kind of what we talked about earlier right it's like if you're driving the car incorrectly and you're thinking it's a setup problem because the car is just understeering like a peg but you're on throttle turning point to get rid of that understeer, you're gonna have to jack up the setup so much that you're never going to get the same ceiling, right? It's sort of like by getting the throttle in the incorrect place, it's sort of like you've lowered the ceiling of grip of the car 20% right off the bat. Mm -hmm. Now, maybe you can get it up to 82% by adding some arrow and jacking up the setup, but it's never going to get back to 100%. But now when we try to fix your driving, when we try to go up to 100%, the car's going to be so bad that you can't drive it that way. It's going to be like super free on entry and it's trying to kill you, right? Part of being a good driver is also having a car you can trust. So if you're trying to set, do setup work or upgrades around bad driving, you're going to really harm yourself at a further date when you start to realize, maybe I don't know everything about this. Let me try to drive this thing correctly. And by the way, you're just not going to go as fast, right? right. Um, so that's why it's – I'm all for it. And I talk to a lot of drivers I work with, like a lot – like I work with the one guy, Ben. He's doing aero upgrades over the winter, and I'm trying to help him as much as I can because he's at the point where he should be doing that. Um, but it's just – do that secondarily, which I know is not in the DNA of a lot of us. There's a lot of us in this sport that love tinkering on things that are engineers. Uh, I know this is the boring thing to hear, but I promise it's the right thing to hear. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we always say that, you know, you can't optimize your car if you don't know what that means. And oh, 100%. You know, especially early. You don't really know what you what you're doing. You don't know what you're where you're aiming, and you don't really know even what you like the car to do. Yeah. So, and, and to be honest with you, even in my whole career, there's there's more there's more options in amateur racing than there is in pro racing, which mm -hmm. is actually probably a negative. Like throughout my whole career, it was you know we couldn't just re-engineer the car. Most things were spec, right? So sure, we could go from you know, Penske shocks to JRZ shocks. Um, we could, you know, up, you know, do some, you know, different spring rate stuff, different, you know, ride height stuff. But we weren't doing things like completely re-engineering re the arrow of the car or the geometry of the car or, you know, even going from one tire compound to another. We didn't do that often. Um, so, and I wouldn't know where the hell to start. If you gave me a car, you know, like, hey, go for it. Just go, you can do whatever you want. I'd be like, uh, uh. I don't know. And I think I've got a pretty good amount of experience here. So it's way, way too easy to get lost. That might be the only time we have a chance at beating you, Dion, is if you were the one setting I, up the car. Oh, that would be good. That would be, I, if you give me a good setup, mm -hmm. I can drive it and say, okay, I need a little bit more of this, a little bit more of this. I can make some setup changes. Be okay at that. Anything above that, you don't want me close. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, they don't want us near close either, Dion. So don't feel bad. It's okay. It's okay. I'm not complaining. I'd rather drive it anyway. <laughs> All right. So, so since you came on, we've got some more silly questions, and we don't want to give away. I love the silly answer. questions. We we don't want to give away your entire book. We're gonna make sure people go buy it because we mm -hmm. literally I wrote all of these questions from the first twenty pages. So <laughs> so there's let's see how many pages we got two hundred and five. So ten times more. To read so <laughs> so with our fast and furious story time questions we have a few we have not bothered you with let's hit them we're gonna bother you a little bit with them so miss vicky you gonna pick a few sure um i do i do before we get started i would like to for those that are new to our audience to uh talk a little bit more about blaze oh that's true okay we, we yeah so, We've used it so uh, much, it's kind of like understood. Yeah, for us. it's kind of like, yeah, it's Blaze. <laughs> so for those, I mean, we've talked about your book, and there's a little bit of background <laughs> in your book, I'm sure. But let's talk a little bit more about um, how long has Blaze been in business right now? Yeah, well, first off, I, I hope we don't come into like a make this sound like a sales the type of no, thing because no, no, that's definitely not, not the context. Yeah, no. So what uh, I want to do yeah. is is I want to establish your pedigree for Got this it. book. Yes. Got it. 
Yeah, so Blaze, I started Blaze uh, when I retired from pro racing in 2018. Uh, So we started towards the end of 2018, early 2019. So we're going on four years now, Mm -hmm. almost five years now. Wow. Mm -hmm. And it it provides coaching and instruction? Yeah. Essentially, the, 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 the thesis I had was... I went to a lot of events and I thought this was initially just a racing problem, but it turns out it exists pretty much everywhere. Um, mm-hmm. I found accessibility to world-class professional coaches was just not there. Um, it was, you know, most people couldn't work with great coaches because it was too expensive. I didn't know who they were and it wasn't convenient. At the same mm-hmm. time, the business model of coaching sucks, right? If you go talk to most coaches, they're not making a great life. Um, it's tons of travel. It's very manual. It's hard to scale yourself, uh, which then means if you can't make a lot of money doing it, you're not going to get a lot of great, high quality people doing that action, right? If I can make a lot more money doing this other thing, why the hell would I coach? So the whole premise right. was, how do I help great coaches scale while keeping the coaching personalized? As much as I'm a, uh, I'm a fan of putting content out there, I wrote a book and I create a whole bunch of things. In the day, coaching has to be personalized. I always talk about have I watched Serena Williams' masterclass? Of course. Did I actually learn much from it? Not really. It was entertaining, but it wasn't really helpful because I didn't know like which of those 17, 20, or 20 different things was I actually doing wrong. So I wanted to keep it personalized, but wanted to do it in a way that helps coaches scale themselves, but makes it more convenient and, and accessible and, and fun and, 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 and something that's more affordable at the end of the day. So essentially at Blaze, we have an online platform where you pick a coach, all of our coaches are vetted, go through a high curation uh, process, and you build a long-term relationship with them that they're personalized. So you get uh, an intro call with them, one-on-one, let's talk about your goals, talk about what you're struggling with, what you're doing well. You get the chat message with them through our app anytime. You upload your videos for race car drivers. It could be you know, a uh, video from your very first race track or race driving ever, or just a one lap you know, GoPro video. Or you can upload race craft stuff and have someone like Ricky Taylor talk to you about your race starts and your consistency and saving fuel, all of that type of stuff. And those things are recorded since so you can go back and watch and rewatch anytime. Um, and you really build this relationship with a coach that they're reviewing your videos, you're chatting with them, uh, and they're sort of always available for you. Um, and so what we've done is, is essentially that over the last four or five years, build infrastructure around it. We started in car racing, and now we're expanding into things like soccer and guitar coaching and the medical space oh, and, and cool. outside of yeah yeah it's a, been a coach lot of fun. is a coach coach I, I, the most and you have the thing platform to me, yeah what's been so interesting to me is i've now sort of worked with coaches in car racing motorcycle racing go-karting surfing stand-up paddle soccer guitar and then now a little bit of surgery there's one thing that has been mentioned in every single coaching session that I've sort of monitored and watched. Can you guess that what that one thing could be? Captain's log supplemental. So, Bill, guess what? What? We did the Sentinel. We, we did, did the Sentinel. We did. We, How did we you were like ta- it? You know what? We were talking about the Sentinel. We have. It was great. We we understood watching how the Sentinel works, mm-hmm. but we finally got it into our car. And I got to tell you, that was really awesome. I was able to see every one of my mistakes. <laughs> we have hours of them. We have hours of my mistakes, okay. but we have hours of good stuff too, which is awesome. It actually showed us the speed that shows where we were on track. We were streaming it. for. We were streaming it live. We were boring billions of people across the world. <laughs> But it was it was pretty incredible. Plus, on it, you're able to put your insignia, your logos on yep. on your app also, and the clarity was amazing. It was and it was really easy to put in, well, easier easy. than I thought it was. I know so, you're making a big deal out of it. I'm like, it's really not that hard. A- it actually, was, it, it, to be focused on it, it wasn't too bad. And then we got some help. No. It was pretty. Yeah, easy. it was. It uh, was pretty good. You know what? I liked the the stream because some of the tracks we go to don't have great cell phone coverage, but it's got mm-hmm. a. Uh, a USB stick backup. So mm-hmm. I just uploaded the high quality video without the cellular interruption. So mm-hmm. uh, if you watched us earlier and said, wow, they got from there to there really quickly, you can watch the real video and see that, no, no, we didn't. It's just a cell phone went out. <laughs> mm-hmm. but- yeah. So the learning curve for me, obviously, I'm slightly techno Amish. Slightly. What, slightly. W- when it comes to the wiring and stuff like that. But 
we get it in and I love it. We were able to sit there right at the track and watch what we were doing in the car. And that was yeah. amazing. Which was good because if you have a problem with your radio, you can tell, you know, if something is going on that you need to know about. Like mm-hmm. a couple of times we've had cars come in and we didn't know they were broken. And I know it's hard to imagine one of our cars being broken, but, you know, whatever. But you can watch the video. And even with the cell phone coverage we had at that particular event, um, it was like a 30 second delay. So it wasn't mm-hmm. bad. Mm-hmm. And uh, you can compare multiple drivers because you have each of the stints are broken up. So uh, we got to work on not only our driving, but uh, if uh, we wanted to, we could work on our pit stops and see exactly what we do. And there's some things that we need to talk about as a team. And uh, it was pretty good. You know, like I said, it takes me, once we got the wiring hooked up for the power, it's, I probably could go from an empty shell to a full up setup running Sentinel. I could probably do that in like 20 minutes. Mm-hmm. So you could literally install it in a car before a race. It's kind of fun. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we got when- to see the driver and the front windshield. And I, yep. if we want to, we can have three. We can see backwards or one of the guys we were going to work with at the upcoming event. He wanted to, he said, could you put a camera on the driver's eyes so we could see what they're looking at? Mm-hmm. I said, I said, why? Yes. Yes, I can. I haven't done it yet, but I'll figure it out. I've got time. Well, I love it. All right. Very well. That sounds like I can buy another one then. Woo! <laughs> Eyes. Really? Where the person's Vision. looking. Every wow. single coach has referenced the guitar coach. See how you're, look, you're looking at the ninth fret? I want you to look at the 10th fret. The surgeon coach really? and where the person's looking. The, every single one of those has been really interesting. The language of how we all communicate, the, it is, is, it, it's, I, I've been, I never would have thought I would have any, anything in relation to a soccer coach. But it is like scarily similar. Sure, wow. soccer skills don't don't correlate to car racing skills. But like the type, like I can't even explain the types of information you're hearing. That I'm like, man, I've said almost the same thing a thousand times. It is, it's right. actually really, really crazy, really surprising, and really fascinating. Well, wow. when you're when you're dribbling through the cones when you're playing soccer, it's just like slalom. So you know you're, exactly. It's, it's you got to have that nice lo- loose rear end to exactly. get the rotation around exactly. the cones. Downshifting <laughs> is is difficult, exactly. but you know. You can try. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's been super surprising. I never would have guessed that. Yeah, wow. makes sense. Yeah, yeah, totally. So and uh, it, no matter what level you're at, I think you can get yep. something from it because you know. Even when the first video that I sent in, you guys found something. Actually, I think it was you, Dion. You actually found something that I did right, which was, you know, difficult, but you, you did it. But yeah, uh, I, I think it was helpful. I think that's probably one of the most misunderstood things is a lot of us see coaches in movies where they're like yelling at people and like nobody wants that, right? Um, right. And we're not, I don't want to be falsely positive. Like, it, it, I, I'm not going to just like, you know, be your be cheerleader. Like, a coach is. A coach is someone, it's, a, it's an interesting relationship, right? Like you're, you need to be friends, but not friends to where you're not willing to tell the other person the truth is sort of how I look at it, right? right. Um, so we try to be genuinely positive when we see things going well, like we're happy about that. We want you to be happy about that. We want you to know that. Um, and then, you know, what, when, when we can improve things, it's, it's not a, what the hell are you doing? That, that doesn't do anyone good. It's a, Let's talk about what you're doing, why you're doing that, why it's not what we want to see, and then how are we actually going to fix that? All of that is good coaching if you can do it concisely. Yeah, and I, like I, that. I, I think the thing that you guys have done really well is, at least with the interaction that Vicky and I have had, was you gave us what we needed to know at the level we were at, not mm-hmm. above and not below, because sometimes you can there's something we should work on, but before that we should work on this. And you guys yeah. have hit that every time. And and that's, so that's, that, that is why coaching has to be personalized. What you just said. And, and by the way, I fall into this trap myself. Like I said, I, my wife and I go watch every YouTube video on tennis. And of course, like sometimes you're a lot of what people will do is they'll go and show you what the pros are doing. The last thing we should be doing is trying to emulate Novak Djokovic. Like we're not Novak Djokovic. We're not ready to care about what he's trying to do there, right? Like it's this, this we should close. Be going, what a, this close. You know, so close. What the heck, man? <laughs> Just give me another three inches of height and a lot more skill, and then I'll be right there, right? Exactly. Um, it's the racket. So that's that's, 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 that's what it is. Part. 
it's always that that and it's like it's super windy here the wind yep. you know it's he know. would struggle in this wind <laughs> I know. He would. He would. That's fun. <laughs> exactly mm-hmm. all right <laughs> so now we're going to get ready and hop into our fast and furious questions that we have not asked you yet cool. and i am going to start off with what is your car race number and why 24 um, pretty much every one of my childhood favorite athletes growing up were 24. I love Jeff Gordon. I love Ken Griffey Jr. Um, I'm sure there's a few other people I can't even remember off the top of my head right now, but 24 was always my number. Very nice. Do your cars have names? No. Oh, mine don't either. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're I have newer. driven race cars that have been named, but I was never really into that. Yeah. Your new one's got four names and you haven't raced it yet. I know. It does. <laughs> Other people have named it. That's true. <laughs> well, you yeah, gotta name it yourself. If it has a name, yeah, then you gotta. So far, it's been called the Duracell and the Nemo car because mm-hmm. <laughs> it, it's like copper colored. <laughs> That's awesome. I love that. With black stripes. Yeah. Yes. So, right. uh, racy. Exactly. Um, do you have any pre race rituals? Maybe anything you do yes. or perhaps a song? Um, songs, no. My pre-race ritual is I need to go find five to ten minutes by myself. Um, I go through my sort of mental process. My mental process is starting off by going through sort of uh, – I, I I hate the word mantra, uh, but it's what people typically use. But essentially, I've got some words to myself that I try to kind of repeat, which is essentially precision focus in the moment on the task at hand to the exclusion of everything else. And then I focus on square breathing, trying to clear my mind, not visualize, not a thing, just bring the breath in, focus on the body, um, and bring my intensity up. And that's really it. Then I'm ready to go. That's awesome. Mm. No lucky underwear or anything like that, unfortunately. No. 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 <laughs> that's good. See. Um, yeah, I know. Uh where would your uh, ultimate road trip be to and from? Ooh, and in what car? That, that is a great question. With your Honestly, wife. I, with <laughs> my wife. I it better be. Sort of, yeah, exactly. I would be. I would. I kind of did this road trip back in the day with some college friends. I'd love to review with my wife. It starts in um, Johannesburg, South Africa. You oh. drive up to the Waterberg Mountains, where uh, sort of straight north. And mm-hmm. there's uh, some, like, uh, my family used to have a place there where it's in a game park, but the game park isn't with a lot of dangerous animals, so that you can, like, go out and walk around and run. So we would, used to go on run- workouts, and, like, there was, like, a, a hill there where I'd do hill sprints, and there's baboons and stuff like that up above us. So still somewhat dangerous, but not, there's no, like, lions and things like that there. Uh, so there, then you would drive over to Kruger National Park, down mm-hmm. through Kruger National Park, and then from there, we would drive straight south pretty much uh, to Port Elizabeth. And mm-hmm. then from Port Elizabeth to Cape Town, there's a thing called the Garden Route. It goes right. through Nisna and a few other places. Such a lovely part of the world. We go from there over to Cape Town. And then you can fly over to Cape Town. You don't need to go back to Johannesburg. But that, that's sort of the route that we did. And it was uh, it was some of the best times of my life. I love South Africa. Wow. I love the parks and then the, the, you know, the nature. And then you get to the water and the people. And it's, that, that's definitely it. Yeah. The thing that surprised me most being down there was the, uh, let's call it the butchers. Yeah. With the trees. 100%. Kind of like, okay. <laughs> Sounds like well. We're rolling with it. <laughs> That's all right. Sounds good. Looks like looks like a good place to do it. Sure. <laughs> yep. Uh, it's a bit of a different country. <laughs> a little different. It was fun, though. I had a great yeah. time. Still, still one of my favorite stories to get you an idea of South Africa. So my parents were... were uh, they em, em, uh, emigrated to the United States. I've spent most of my life here. Uh, and then they actually moved back to South Africa in 2016 and then moved back to the States. And so they live in, in a place called Help Bay. And this was probably, I don't know, 2021. Um, they, they were talking to us and they're like, yeah, so we, we no longer get mail here. I was like, oh, w- what happened? And they're like, well, the uh, post office had all the like mail bikes that the mail delivery people have and they mm-hmm. all got stolen. So they have no more bikes to, to, to use. And I was like, oh, well, that, that sucks. But like, you can still go to, to the post office to pick up mail, right? They're like, well, on top of that, the post office forgot to pay their lease. 
So they got evicted. So there is no post office that we can go to anymore here. <laughs> I was just like, this is the most African thing I've heard of in a long time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, I still remember sitting there waiting for dinner and we were getting ready to eat. And then the monkey came in and grabbed stuff off the table and left. And yep. everybody was I'm like, oh, now. That's, that's normal. And I'm like, sitting there like, it's not normal and where I'm from. <laughs> it is. Oh, yeah. Honestly, it's one like, of the best. What the? It is one of the best countries in the world, though. For all its flaws, for all its problems, which it has plenty, uh, highly recommend going. Oh, yeah, for sure. It was it was great. I, yeah. the, the only thing bad about it was I wasn't able to bring Vicky on the trip when I was there, but we'll get there someday. We just need to go again. I know. That's I know. right. It should be fun. So <laughs> uh, what is your favorite thing to order at or near a track? And it, whichever one comes to mind first. Ooh, at or near a track. Okay, so a couple things come to mind. Post Daytona 24 hour, there's a five guys right across the street. Mm -hmm. That's must my jam. I got to go to five guys after the 24 hour. My wife and I always used, always used to do that. That's one that comes to mind. Um, gosh, I am drawing a complete blank. When you go to the Nordschleife, a curry versed at any of the restaurants right nearby, there's one that's like downstairs. I forgot the name of it right now, but that's like iconic that you got to go to. Mm -hmm. Um, Food, there used to actually surprisingly be a really good Indian place in Sebring. I don't think it exists really? anymore, which I'm really bummed about. I know Seth Nyman from Fly Lizard took us there and we're like, you want to go eat Indian in Sebring, Florida? I, I don't know or about that. And it was actually really good. Uh, yeah. But I think that place went away. Um, I think those are the things that come top of mind right now. What am I okay. missing? What, what What's on your list? Uh, the one that is probably my favorite on track food is there's a barbecue truck at pit race. That's fantastic. Oh yeah. That one's good. I've had that plenty of times out there. I definitely mm -hmm. recommend that for sure. That's a good one. Yeah. So that's, that's my favorite. And Vicky's favorite is why do you, why do you keep asking this dumb question? And I keep saying, <laughs> because I need to know. Because he needs <laughs> Give to us know the good food to eat when he's on the road. That's right. Oh yeah. You and me both, man. I got to find the good spots to eat. It's right. so much. It's so much better than you know the Yelp review. I'm like, no, race car drivers are hungry people when they're done. They know where the good stuff is. Yeah, Honestly, right. what was surprised me the most when I think about good food, and I can't think of a single restaurant name, unfortunately, but just like the best food I had over a, uh, a race weekend, Detroit, racing yeah. at Belle Isle. I've been like I like anybody else would have thought, you know, Detroit. I don't know about that. We had some great food there, like really cool places done up right. The quality, I that is to me the most surprising food mm -hmm. experience I've had. I was like pleasantly surprised by that, and like lots of good options. I could, I could see that it's you know yeah. unexpected. Ms. Yeah, Vicky. very much so. Yeah, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll have to go race at Detroit now, Miss Vicky. That's right. So, what is your favorite track so far? I have two. Uh, that I've really struggled picking between, and that would be Watkins Glen or Road Atlanta. Really? You've got, a follow -up. You've got a follow up question. Yeah. And what is your favorite turn so far? Ooh, I mean, it's it's hard to beat turn 12 at Road Atlanta. That, yeah. one's, that one's pretty mega. Mm -hmm. um, I really like actually the NASCAR circuit at Watkins Glen and doing. The carousel where you kind of like really loop mm -hmm. around. That one was a lot of fun. Honestly, surprisingly, one of the most fun turns I've done. Two other ones come to mind that aren't at that racetrack. The carousel on the Norwich Life is just iconic, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then there is uh, Sunset Bend at Kailami in South Africa is a really cool corner. There's not – so Kailami, you know, Sandersburg is a, a pretty high elevation place, a lot of right. elevation change. It's built up on a bit of a hill. So when you come through it, it's sort of a slower corner, kind of hairpin-ish. When you look to your right, you overlook the entire city. Mm -hmm. uh, and I am the most oblivious race car driver. Like I drove at Barber and there's a museum turn. And I kept asking people like, why is it called a museum term? And it's because the museum's like right there. And I just like didn't see it while I was driving. So somehow I was able to kind of like Kyle Lowry look out. You just see the whole thing. That one's really cool. Cause you don't get that a lot on the racetrack. No, not so much. Mm. Yeah. Uh, just in case it changed, Miss Jennifer's favorite question is what is your favorite car movie or car from a movie of all time? Car movie, I 
I'm suspecting that it's going to change here in the next few months with that new Formula One movie coming out with mm-hmm. Brad Pitt. I'm I've got high hopes for that one to to take over the top spot. Mm-hmm. Um, outside of that, I mean, it's a it's a tough one between Days of Thunder and Talladega Nights, like. <laughs> you know, those are. I was not <laughs> expecting those two from you, Dion. I like <laughs> it. Really? Uh-huh. Like, those are those are both great, just great movies, right? Um, you, I, I sure I love Stena and I know all the Russian, all those fun ones, but like I don't know, those two are just are are oh, iconic. That's fun. We yeah, uh, we just found a new one this weekend. It was the uh, the Michael Fassbender. On oh yeah, the Russell Lamar one. Yeah. Uh-huh. Is it good? I haven't seen it yet. Yeah. It's free on YouTube and definitely worth yeah. the hour and a half. So nice. Yeah. It's been on my list. The yep. one I can't tell if I want to see is the Jan Marlboro Grand Turismo one that came out that has really good reviews. The race in action just looks so cheesy that I'm like, I don't know if I can watch this. Um, that's kind of the feedback we've gotten. I have not seen it yet, but Something. People rave about it. Uh and I know Jan and, and his story's awesome. I just I'm like, right. I don't know if I can see that. <laughs> Yeah. Miss Vicky, yeah. got one more? Yeah. Um, this is one that's always kind of interesting. What is the one car, if any, that you would wipe away from history if you could? Oh, that's an interesting one. Man. <laughs> it's kind of harsh. We finally got one. <laughs> but, gosh. I, I, my, my mind goes in so many different ways. Um, <laughs> oh, my gosh. What is, can, does that have to be a race car? Because I would say nope. the PT Cruiser nope. is one night nope. I would absolutely just drop kick right out of history. Right. That, what, <laughs> I think what, that thing what is What do we hideous. call that? The uh, midlife crisis car? It's one of them, yeah. <laughs> that was one of yeah, them for those the... who thought that it was cool. <laughs> Yeah. I don't know many people that thought that was cool. Uh, and I go out on a limb because my, my wife's cousin had one and, and she knows how much I hate that car. <laughs> oh. um, that's the first thing that comes to mind. I, I would really want to know Jeremy Clarkson's answer on that. That would be fascinating to me because he probably oh. knows everything out there. Future oh podcast guest. He just doesn't know it yet, yes. but that's fine. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I'll let you farming know. farming in the worst cars of all time. Exactly. Do, you know, do you know what a tell is on that PT Cruiser? Is that there's none left. You never see them on the road anymore. That's how bad it yeah. was. Yeah, that's a really good point. Thank, <laughs> thank God for humanity that that thing broke down. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The, yeah, usually they would be like, you know, hangovers or not hangovers, but layovers, whatever, that yep. they would just carry through. You start see a couple stragglers. You don't, rarely even see any stragglers. That's how bad it was. 100%. 100%. <laughs> the, best, the best thing they did is make it as bad as they did, apparently. That's right. <laughs> Indeed. Okay. Well, it's a, it's a little bit of a wordsmith, but uh, automatic sticker paddles or don't care and front wheel drive, rear wheel drive, four wheel drive, or don't care. So uh depends on the occasion for if I am racing and I care about the race, give me the paddle shifts. If I am on track, having a lot of fun, sequential box. Those are the two things. Okay. Um, Four wheel drive all the way on the on the other one, like okay. absolutely right. in, in all situations. Like why a four wheel drive in a race? Great for the rain, still grippy, good for off roading. So across the board. Okay, Here's except, except for skid pads, then 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 rear wheel drive or donuts and rear wheel drive Ex- exactly. Or, or uh, <laughs> except for the fun things or uh, lunch trays on the back wheels. Either way, <laughs> yeah, that'll work. <laughs> all right, okay. this is gonna be our last one. Last one. I've got one question. You or do you want to do yours? You go ahead. No. Okay. I've got this one, and one. then you you can do one after. No, this, the, this is your last one. This is Ooh, the last one. Oh, this is the last one? Okay, fine. Yes. I'll edit. No I'll pressure. Edit. Make it good. I'll edit. I'll edit. <laughs> All right, Dion. This is where you get yourself in trouble. We saved it for the end. Best racing drivers are in what discipline? Rally, F1. Ooh, that's a good one. NASCAR, Lemons. That's a really good one. So, mm, like we I'll put them all in the same practice, cars, and they yeah. do like all the different disciplines. Who's going to win? Sebastian Loeb. Okay, I think he's I think he's proved to be the best all around driver of the generation. I I so I lean because of him to rally. I will preface that to be honest and say I haven't watched a lot of rally recently, mm-hmm. um, and I don't know a lot of the people, and I haven't really come over to our side as much back in like lobe days right 
So it, it, I could be like, I'm, I'm not less certain of that now, but I think overall rally, I, I think Loeb comes over and proves that every time he's quick in the form of the one car, he's quick in the LMDH cars, he's quick in rally car and he wins race to champions. So I would say that's, that's sort of the top discipline right now. So we should go practice rally driving this winter or maybe some snow. And that would absolutely correlate over and help your track driving as well. There is a complete and utter correlation that I've seen to confident drivers on the racetrack and drivers that are just screwed around in the car. Like I can almost watch a driver and just see like, you've never done a donut in your life. I know that this is going to to help you like one-to-one correlation. Just go out there and do a donut. I just want you to feel what it feels like because you're going to be more confident on the racetrack. Um, I know it's counterintuitive and probably not a lot of people want to hear that, but it's the truth. Vicky's never done a burnout ever. Let's change it. We got to change it. I, I guarantee you, I guarantee you it's worth a half second of lap time like mm-hmm. that. It makes no sense at all. It makes no sense, but it'll just make you more confident driver just to feel it. Yeah. And it looks cool and it's fun. And it looks cool. <laughs> yeah. And, and I will post a video of it when it finally happens. <laughs> yeah. I want to see that video next year, right? Comp school and burnouts. There it That's is. Right. 2024 <laughs> in the book. That's all we need. I love and it. you just got to say, well, I'm just warming up the tires. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Get a little grip. That's all I'm doing. Yep. So <laughs> I tell my engineers and they yell at me. <laughs> <laughs> no I love it. Dion, if they want to come find you, Blaze is the best place. Yeah, totally. If you just message any of our support channels, I do all of that personally. So my email for people who want to email me, Dion at Blaze.io. Um, on Twitter at Dion BMR. I think I've got the same thing on Instagram as well. Um, so I'm pretty accessible. Just search for me and you'll probably find Blaze and hit contact us or email me or whatever the X calls it now or whatever it might be. Just um, I'm pretty much on all the normal platforms. I'm pretty accessible and easy to find. Price of doing business, right? Exactly, man. Exactly. <laughs> and uh, we highly recommend your book. You can't, but that's fine. And uh, we have <laughs> copies, and uh, I believe some of our team will be getting them for Christmas. So they don't listen. So I, I can say anything I want. <laughs> I appreciate that, and and I appreciate you uh, putting up for me with four episodes now. That's wild. I don't know how you guys do it. No, you, you're going to get one of those like uh, Saturday Night Live gold jackets next time you come on the, the five times. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> five time co host. We might have to send that like some an, uh, an oil jacket swag, or something like you know? that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'd rock it. Maybe 100%. We'll, we'll get you a uh, garage here as a training hoodie if you do five. So, you know, incentive uh, to come well, back I, one more time. That means I just got to go write a whole other book. Well, we would read it. <laughs> I don't know yep. if I've got enough, enough material yet in my mind. Uh, ah. okay. Well, if you need uh, information on how to do things wrong, we can send you some more videos and you can say, don't <laughs> do we go. this. There you go. <laughs> that, that could be like, you know, the uh, next one is like Bennett, what not to do the art and racing of crashing cars, something exactly. like that. <laughs> exactly. You know, don't try to save it when you know you can't. Only bad things <laughs> yeah. happen. So. Yeah, pretty much, man. <laughs> Hopes to live by. Exactly. Thank you, Dion. Yeah. We will bother you again, as always. Thank you, guys. It's been a lot of fun. Appreciate it. <laughs>